Hello viewers, welcome to Newsweek South Asia, a program that talks about breeding of terrorism and its impact on South Asian nations. Let's begin with the headlines first. Targeted killings of Kashmiri Hindus in Jammu and Kashmir are becoming alarming. Explosion rocks Pakistan's Karachi at least one dead and several injured. And Taliban orders women TV anchors to cover their faces on air. Let's start the show with India's Jammu and Kashmir, where the situation is tense. The region has been witnessing a spate of terrorist attacks against Hindu minority over the past few months. In the latest, two lashkar e taiba terrorists barged into a government office in Kashmir's Budgam district and shot point-blank at Rahul Bhatt, a Kashmiri pandit who was a government employee over there. The death of Rahul Bhatt has triggered protests and raised questions about the security of the minority community in the valley. We have a detailed report. The spectre of 1990s horror has come back to haunt the valley with the selective design of targeting and killing a member of the Hindu community. On May 12th, Jammu and Kashmir witnessed yet another instance where a Kashmiri Pandit was targeted and killed by Pak back terrorists. Rahul Bhatt, a Kashmiri Pandit who was a clerk in the Revenue Department, was shot dead by terrorists in Budgam district. Two Lashkara terrorists barged into his office in broad daylight and shot him down. He was immediately taken to an hospital where he later succumbed to his injuries. Triggered by the attack, pundits in Kashmir held protests at several places against the killing of Rahul Bhatt and demanded stern action against the terrorists. Rahul Bhatt's family, drowned in sadness over the cold-blooded murder, remain inconsolable with tears continuously rolling down their eyes. His wife kept crying copiously over the sudden tragic death of her husband. कितने हालात खराब है उधर इतना दूर रखा था एक सिक्योरिटी गार्ड नहीं था उधर जब तक वो रिवॉल्वर लेके अंदर घुस गया मैंने उसको बोला था तो डीसी ऑफिस ही बैठा कर डीसी ऑफिस ही ट्रांसफर करा ले नहीं किया डीसी ने ट्रांसफर नहीं किया उसको नहीं किया किसी को भी नहीं किया उसने ट्रांसफर कहीं पे भी नहीं दूर दूर रहे सारे ये दो घंटे लगते थे उसको वहाँ जाने में वहाँ से आने में कुछ नहीं बोला था कुछ भी नहीं बोला था उसके सारे बहुत अच्छे थे सारे उसके साथ अच्छे थे बहुत था मुझे कोई नहीं नुकसान पहुँचा सकता मुझे सारे बहुत वहाँ पे इज्जत करते हैं सारे इज्जत करते हैं मगर उन्होंने भी नहीं बचाया किसी से तो पूछा होगा उन्होंने कि ये क्या है क्या नहीं है उनको कैसे पता चला यहाँ पे ये है the recent killing of Rahul Bhatt is just another addition to the list of attacks on Kashmiri pundits in the valley. Last month, on April 13th, a terrorist shot down and killed Satish Kumar Singh, a Rajput, outside his home in Kakaran village, bordering Shopia and Kulgam district. On April 4th, terrorists shot and injured a Kashmiri pundit Balakrishnan Bhatt in South Kashmir's Kulgam. In the last six months, more than seven members of the minority community have been selectively killed, including two Kashmiri pundits. Attacks on the Hindu community in Jammu and Kashmir have witnessed a spike in the last few months. Recently, banned terror group Jammu and Kashmir Liberation Front exploded a bus full of pilgrims headed from Katra to Jammu near Karmal, in which four people lost their lives and 22 were injured. According to a recent data produced by the Ministry of Home Affairs, 14 members of the Hindu community have been killed by terrorists in the valley between 2019 and 2022. Of late, terrorist handlers sitting in Pakistan have changed their strategy as far as attacks and targeted killings are concerned. They are now concentrating mainly on soft targets. ये किस्सा तो 32 साल पहले शुरू हो गया था जब से 1989 में टिकला टब्लू की शादत हुई थी तब से लेकर आज तक पहले इन कश्मीरी पंडित 3000 कश्मीरी पंडितों को वहां पर मौत के घाट उन्होंने उतारा उसके बाद 6 लाख लोगों का प्लाइन इन्होंने कर दिया आप भाग जाओ नहीं तो हम मार देंगे आप या तो कन्वर्ट हो जाओ या तो इस्लाम आप कबूल करो मस्जिदों में लाउड स्पीकरों में वहां पर उन्होंने चलाया कि भाग जाओ मैं सरकार से रिक्वेस्ट करता हूं कश्मीरी पंडित को एक जगह बसाइए उनकी नौकरी भी उसी के आसपास दे दीजिए और सिक्योरिटी दे दीजिए तब जाके वो वहां पर सेफ रहेंगे 
Kashmir was witnessing the return of peace once again and people had understood that terrorism and separatism cannot flourish in Jammu and Kashmir. This is the biggest pain for Pakistan, which has been trying to internationalize the Kashmir issue for over seven decades. By creating a communal rift, it wants to give a few more days of life to the dying terrorism in Jammu and Kashmir. It also wants to reinstate fear in the minds of common Kashmiri people that to get killed, one not needs to be an influential person, being from a minority community is sufficient enough. Their tactics are kill one and scare a thousand. That is how they have succeeded in hunting out the entire population of Kashmiri pundits from their roots. However, such barbaric terror acts will not succeed in undermining Jammu and Kashmir development journey as people in Kashmir will not let this conspiracy succeed. Let's move to Pakistan's Karachi which once again rocked by a blast that took place on a busy road in southern area on Monday. According to the bomb disposal squad, explosive materials was planted in the carrier of the bicycle which was detonated by a time device. This is the latest incidence in the series of such attacks. Earlier, on May 12, a bomb explosion in the southern area had left one person dead and 13 others wounded. The police had said that a vehicle of the Pakistan Coast Guards was a possible target. A report. In a third blast in as many weeks, a woman died and at least 12 people sustained injuries when an improvised explosive device attached to a motorbike went off in a busy market in Karachi. The police vehicles and a few other vehicles, including two-wheelers and a three-wheeler, were damaged in the blast that also triggered a fire. घर तक आवाज भी आई और तमाम बच्चे जो नीचे खेल रहे थे वो भी बहुत ज्यादा खौफ और हिरास में मुब्तला Many among the injured were in critical condition and most of them got wounded after being hit by ball bearings from explosive materials. The injured were immediately taken to Jinnah Post Graduate Medical Center. In short, this is about 10 patients. In addition, there are also 2-3 more people who came from minor injuries. They came from minor injuries and they came from minor injuries. But the 10 patients I have brought to me, one of them is a girl. She has a head and a head injury. The area around the blast site is said to be densely populated and a heavily frequented business hub of the city. This is not the first of its kind of terrorist outage but is the latest in the series of such attacks. On May 12, a bomb explosion in the southern area had left one person dead and 13 others wounded. The police had said that a vehicle of the Pakistan Coast Guards was a possible target. Sadr is Karachi's busiest commercial area. The recent uptick in attacks provides evidence of a resurgence of terrorism in the country. Most of the attacks have been claimed by tehreek e taliban Pakistan, who wants to establish an Islamic caliphate in Islamabad. The development comes amid a precarious situation for Pakistan, which was criticized heavily across global quarters for encouraging the Taliban offensive against the erstwhile Ashraf Ghani government in Afghanistan. But so far, the newfound Taliban regime has only led to more discomfort for Islamabad. The militants, after sweeping to power, freed several terrorists wanted by the Pakistan government from jails in Afghanistan. Anybody who's ever supported a terrorist organization should know the concept of a blowback. Remember, uh, this isn't the first time that Pakistani terror assets have turned on Pakistan. Uh, they have a long history uh, of turning on Pakistan and in a way it suits Pakistani propaganda because the more bombs that explode in Pakistan, uh, you know, they can say, oh, we are the biggest victims of terror and this is a card they've played over and over again. I think the problem right now is that the expected blowback is getting out of hand. Uh, they expected some kind of a peace dividend because, you know, now uh, America is not there in Afghanistan and that is not happening. And what is worse is that the Haqqani network seems to be doing to Pakistan what Pakistan did to Afghanistan. 
while the world expressed shock over the astonishingly swift fall of Kabul, prominent Pakistanis raised a toast. They included political parties, senior journalists and retired generals, but none as overtly as Pakistan's then Prime Minister Imran Khan, who said the Afghans have broken the shackles of slavery. But the recent attacks have stunned Islamabad, which was operating on the assumption that the Taliban would be beholden to Pakistan out of gratitude for years of support. Pakistan is paying for its deeds. Atrocities and discrimination against minorities in Pakistan continue unabated. Such crimes have taken in the form of abductions, murders, mass killings, religious conversions and atrocities on allegations of blasphemy. In the latest incident, two businessmen from minority Sikh community in Pakistan were shot dead. Ranjit Singh and Kavaljeet Singh both were shop owners in Batatal Bazaar in Peshawar. People in Pakistan's Peshawar took to the streets to protest against the killing of two Sikh businessmen Kavaljeet Singh and Ranjit Singh. This is the latest targeted killing of minority community members in the northwestern Khyber Pakhtunkhwa province. The two deceased were in the business of spices and had shops in the Batatal Bazaar in Sarbant. On May 15th morning, two unidentified bike-borne assailants attacked and shot dead both businessmen in Batatal Bazaar and fled after the attack. This is not an exclusive case when the Sikh minority in Pakistan has been targeted. In September 2021, a well-known Sikh Hakim Sardar Satnam Singh was shot dead by unidentified gunmen inside his clinic in Peshawar. On 27 July 2020, it was reported that Gurudwara Shahid Bhai Taru Singh, which is the site of martyrdom of Bhai Taru Singh, had been forcibly taken over and was converted into a mosque and named Masjid Shahid Ganj. Targeted killings uh, of uh, minority community and the various crimes against them have been very common in Pakistan. We have seen that during the previous Prime Minister Imran Khan, who wanted to make it into a new Pakistan, these had increased the hate crimes, the kind of crimes against minority, against girls and all, had increased tremendously. We have seen they have been forced upon. And this is a, in Peshawar itself, Pakhtunwa, this is the second uh, time the people in the six have been killed um, in eight months actually in September last also one person was killed so the safety and security of the minority community is obviously um, uh, very important and this is uh, the government uh, of Nawaz Sharif must do its best to protect uh, the minority community Not only the Sikh community, but other community members in Pakistan are facing atrocities. The 2017 census data shows that Muslims have become 96.47 of the total population and other religious minorities have shrunk. Hindus, for example, are at their all-time low at 1.73 of the population. Pakistan has become a hotspot of forced conversion and thriving industry of hate preaching. According to their own Human Rights Commission report, around 1,000 young Hindus and Christians are forced to convert to Islam every year. Moreover, the country has also failed to bring an end to state-approved textbooks and curriculum, which fuels an environment of religious fanaticism. As far as um, the growth in uh, numbers, I mean, they, the statistics speaks for itself. We have seen against the Sikhs, against other minorities, uh, they, against uh, the women being kidnapped, they are forcibly uh, married. Uh, so we are seeing in Pakistan an increased um, incidence of such cases, uh, which is very worrying, in fact. Pakistan tries its best to portray itself as a saviour of minorities and misses no opportunity to pat its back before the international community. However, the reality is far contrary to hefty claims made by Pakistan's government. Since 1990, minorities in Pakistan have been targeted over claims of blasphemy. Even Muslims who speak against these inhuman laws are targeted, 
and this is primarily because government agencies want to settle their personal scores by providing support to Muslims who are in majority in the country. The country's legal institution and society at large have violated every basic norm of human rights. Hence, it is a mandate on the international community concerned with the protection of human rights to take necessary measures. This is high time that international agencies must intervene effectively before it's too late and minorities are completely wiped off from the country. Moving on. Taliban authorities in Afghanistan have asked television broadcasters to ensure that female presenters on local stations cover their faces when on air. The ruling came two weeks after all women were ordered to wear a face veil in public or risk punishment. After they seized power in Afghanistan in August, the Taliban initially appeared to have moderated their restrictions somehow, announcing no dress code for women. But in recent weeks, they have taken a sharp headline pivot that confirmed the worst fears of right activists. Taliban authorities in Afghanistan have asked television broadcasters to ensure that female presenters on local stations cover their faces when on air. The move comes days after authorities ordered women to cover their faces in public a return to a policy of the Taliban's past hardline rule and an escalation of restrictions that are causing anger at home and abroad. Most Afghan women wear a headscarf for religious reasons, but many in urban areas such as Kabul do not cover their faces. During the Taliban's last rule from 1996 to 2001, it was obligatory for women to wear the all-encompassing blue burqa. Since the Taliban came to power, women and girls' rights have been rolled back in areas of great importance to their lives, like access to education, employment and health care, basically even uh, to move around freely. And the consequences are that women and girls are in excluded from public life. These restrictions also severely limit Afghanistan's ability to respond to the catastrophic humanitarian situation. Uh, which again may lead to violence and radicalization and instability in the country and the region. Taliban overthrew the elected government of Afghanistan last August, established a Stone Age regime with barbaric laws and reversed centuries of women's achievements. The hardliners deprived millions of Afghan women of their right to education, ousted tens of thousands of women from jobs and banned women's businesses and all sorts of activism. Today they have crushed the women of Afghanistan and have plunged them into the dark ages again. The Afghan woman has now lost even the right to life. In March, the Taliban backtracked on their announcement that high schools would open for girls, saying they would remain closed until a plan was drawn up in accordance with Islamic law for them to reopen. Then last week, the group's supreme leader, Habitullah Akhundzada, said that if a woman did not cover her face outside home, her father or closest male relative would be visited and face potential prison or firing from state jobs. Recently, UK's ambassador to the United Nations, Barbara Woodward, at a UN meeting said that such kinds of orders underline the Taliban's inability to lead Afghanistan out of its current economic, social, and humanitarian crisis. She further added that it's hard to see that international community and importantly the Afghan people will ever respect the Taliban as legitimate authorities if this is the future for Afghanistan. They want to remove women and girls entirely from public life. But as the UK's Minister for Afghanistan, Lord Ahmed, has said previously in the Council, Islam is clear on equality for girls and the rights of women. It's hard to see that the international community and importantly the Afghan people will ever respect the Taliban as legitimate authorities uh, if this is the future for Afghanistan that they pursue. Because half its population are women and girls 
who will not and should not have to accept a life banished to the sidelines, nor will their brothers, fathers or sons. So it's regressive, it's wrong, and I think it underlines the Taliban's inability to lead Afghanistan out of its current economic and social and humanitarian crisis. A century ago, Afghanistan's women were free. They enjoyed the right to education, the right to political participation, and the right to movement. Even till the 1970s, more than 60% of the Kabul University students were women, and they had equal participation in many state institutions. Under Taliban rule, the rights of women and girls have worsened, and Afghanistan is facing a desperate humanitarian and economic crisis. It is so hard to imagine how much has changed for so many in so little time. Where once there was hope with women playing a central role in society, there is now hunger, destitution and violence. Afghan women are urging the international community to step in and support the women's rights activists. And with that, we come to the end of this edition of Newsweek South Asia. We will be back next week with more news, views and analysis from the subcontinent. Meanwhile, do keep writing to us at nwsa at anin.com. This is Shivangi Mishra signing off on the behalf of the entire production team of Newsweek South Asia. Goodbye and take care.